All right, let's talk about 1981's Hell Knight, starring Linda Blair and Peter Barton from The Final Chapter. Uh, and this was directed by Tom D. Simone, who is the brother of Billy in Friday the 13th Part 5. And if you look at pictures of them back in the day, they look like identical twins. And this was uh, executive produced by Erwin Yablins, who did Halloween. And Chuck Russell from Dream Warriors and The Blob. He directed those and he produced this one. This movie just has a simple slasher story where you got a bunch of college kids doing this initiation. They have to spend the night at this local mansion that has a dark history and they think it's abandoned. But when they spend the night there, they find out it's not and that... The previous owners, the, the Garf family, some of them are still alive. And they're there picking them off one by one. Which brings me to my first positive. I really like the simple initiation plot, the setting, uh, the look of it, and the history of the Garth family. It's a very disturbing, uh, sick story, what the father did. And he was giving his wife was giving birth to all these ugly mongoloid kids and he kept trying to get a normal looking kid and then eventually he just gave up and snapped and killed his wife and kids but left one alive and you know that's the kid that's still there picking these kids off one by one yeah i like that setup the story and the trapped feeling of you know this film that they're, they're just stuck here at this creepy location and I really like this mansion setting because it also provides a really good moody gothic atmosphere. Everything's lit by candlelight and it's also very beautifully lit in a lot of scenes also. I like the cinematography by Mac Alberg, who would later work with like Stuart Gordon on some of his films. So yeah, a really good cinematographer here. Just lots of great mood and atmosphere that I always like in a horror film. Another thing I always look for in a horror film, a thing that I think is very important to horror films, is the soundtrack and score. This one has a terrific score by Dan Wyman. Now the kills I'm kind of mixed on, but I'll throw them in the positives because they're good enough. You get a couple of creative kills here. It's just that they're a bit censored. They cut away really quickly but I like the idea behind these kills. You get a good decapitation that's done differently than other ones where in other ones it's usually a fake head, but in this one they tried to actually use a real head and a fake body that falls, but it just it cuts away too quickly. You get a couple of other really cool kills, but there's also a couple of cutaway kills, so that's why I'm kind of mixed on it. So there's some hits and misses with the kills. I really liked the Seth character, in this movie, he's kind of like the comic relief, and he's the surfer, and he's wearing these white, whitey tidies with red hearts on them, and he's just such a goofball, but he's not too goofy, and I really like his character in the end, because he becomes kind of like the hero, unexpectedly. You know, they really subvert expectations. You think this guy is going to when he goes to run away, he's going to get killed before he can do so, but he actually runs away, tries to get help, and comes back to help out the other characters. So he's not only the comic relief character, but he's also like the hero of the movie. This movie also has a few good scares and suspense sequences, some good set pieces. I like, you know, the rooftop, the scare up there, and the ladder that's going down by the window, the maze out in the front, like The Shining, like there's a few good set pieces here. And I really liked the final act. I thought the final chase with our final girl, Linda Blair, although kind of short, it was still uh, very intense with this car uh, sequence and some stunts. So it got pretty intense there at the end and I really liked how it wrapped up. Getting into my negatives, I feel like this movie has some pacing issues. There's just a few sequences of walking around and it feels like they're deliberately like stretching it out for suspense and it just goes on a little too long here and there. You, this movie is an hour and 40 minutes and I feel like you could have easily taken out about five or so. One thing this movie is missing that other slashers at the time had is nudity and there were 
a few opportunities for it. We have a sex scene. There's a chick in the open who's flashing her breast to this guy, but we don't see it. And interestingly enough, I found out that the reason why there was no nudity, there was supposed to be, the actress signed on. She was going to show her breasts, but the actor in that sex scene said no because he didn't want his parents, I guess, his family to see this movie and him being a sex scene and be with a naked lady. So they just did it in like silhouettes instead. So that's weird. Usually it's the other way around. You just hear that the girl said no, but in this case, it was the guy that said no. This movie has a couple of tropes in it that always bug me, and, you know, I can look past it. It doesn't really hurt the film. It's a, it's of the time, you know. This is when these tropes became tropes, really, in these slasher films, but you got, like, the whole, the car won't start, but our lead character is a mechanic, so she can fix it right away, and then you got the one that always bugs me, that I just don't think is realistic at all, is the skeptic cops who don't do their job. Like, when someone comes to the police and says that there's murders going on, even if they don't believe them, they still have to go check it out. That's their job. Also, just as a warning, this movie's transfer is not that great. Shot Factory, you know, said they did the best they could. This movie starts with a warning that says, hey, you know, we did the best we could, but there's going to be some shitty spots, and there are some bad spots where the transfer quality takes a dip. I also wasn't big on the look of the killer, the makeup design on their face. They just don't look frightening to me at all. It just didn't work for me. I wish they could have looked more monstrous, this killer, and, you know, just more freaky. Something like the Fun House. If they looked that deformed, it would have definitely increased the intensity and scares here. And my final complaint here is just that Linda Blair is not the best actress. She isn't terrible. I've seen much worse acting in the slashers, but it's just, it could have been way better. I feel like her acting isn't that great, especially when she has to be scared. So final thoughts, I think this is a cult classic slasher that mostly delivers, but just has some slight pacing issues and some irritating tropes in it. It's a perfect movie to watch around Halloween because of the mood and atmosphere here, all the characters wearing costumes. I watch it now every October, and I think fans of this genre will appreciate this film the most. Yeah, it has some flaws, but I really enjoy it. So when it comes to Hell Night, I will give it four out of five stars. So, all right, spoiler discussion. So this movie opens up with a scream, just like scream. And we get some tits flashed off camera, missed opportunity for some TNA there. And I thought it was funny that all these characters are carrying torches instead of flashlights. Although in Great Britain, they call flashlights torches, right? Uh, yeah, they're all holding torches. And driving to the Garth uh, mansion and they have to shoot the lock to get into this place but then when they get inside there's candles already lit inside the house hundreds of candles lit and they don't even question it like well who lit all these candles if this is the first time somebody's coming into this place who lit all the candles so the one guy Peter he gives us the history of this uh, family the Garth family and says that the the father killed his family 12 years ago. So this place has been sitting here empty for 12 years, and I guess Andrew has just been hiding somewhere, but they've been doing this, I believe, every year. But for some reason, it's just now when they bump into Andrew, because they act like this is a yearly thing. Like, you know, what do you gotta do to enter our sorority or fraternity? You gotta stay at the, the Garth place. They act like it's a yearly thing now for the last 12 years. But now, 12 years later, they're just now bumping into uh, Andrew, the youngest kid who survived. And they know about the tunnels and they've been down there. They say something about how they wired up some shit down there. So they know about these secret tunnels and they seem to know about all these secret doors. They know the layout of this place pretty well. The people on the outside pranking the kids inside. But they don't know about Andrew? How is that possible? And the twist, I feel like, is kind of spoiled here, if you do your math. I could be wrong, but what I heard was four people were killed, but three bodies were found. 
and they tell you that Andrew survived. So that means one of the bodies is missing. Oh, well, then there's two killers. So I feel like the two killers thing, uh, it's supposed to be a twist, but it's not a very good one because of that story. Instead of a traditional cat scare, we get an owl scare right before this woman is pulled down into the tunnels and gets her head decapitated, cuts away very quickly, but nonetheless, still a very cool sequence. These kids are pulling some elaborate pranks. They have like all kinds of speakers spread out throughout the house and they have like all the doors and windows like electronically connected to this device. They can just flip a switch and the doors can open and shut. And they have like this hologram ghost thing. Like, how is that even possible? Where do you buy that thing? That thing would be expensive if it does exist. Then we get the second kill in the movie with Scott on the rooftop. And, you know, he gets his head twisted around. And it's pretty effective. I like how they shot it. You know, it's just like in Creep Show, the Father's Day segment. And the killer does something a few times in the movie before each kill. He likes to, like, grab their face and like claw at it but he's not actually like scratching their skin there's no blood on their face so it's just weird that they should have did something with that like have their faces actually get like scratched before but it's just like he's massaging their face like just brushing his fingers down their face and then he kills them then we get some more pranks being done that aren't as elaborate as the other ones but you got like the snake in the drawer and the chicks looking in the mirror and the other guys on the other side and he like flashes a flashlight and making her think that her face is looking deformed and but she's so high on like drugs that she thinks that she's just hallucinating so she doesn't like you know fall for the prank but that whole sequence was really dragged out like it took her like a whole minute to walk from the bed to the door I like that the killer puts Scott's body where the dummy was supposed to be on the wire thing and Peter finds his body, freaks out, runs into the maze and we get a nice scythe kill. Goes right through his heart out the, through the other side of the, the hedge. And this is when we get our first good look at the killer's face. And this is when they give you another clue that there's two killers because, or that this guy's teleporting because you can see the killer over there and then he runs this way and bumps right into the killer so that tells you that there has to be two of them otherwise this guy's teleporting then we get some silhouette sex we don't get to actually see them doing it uh because the actor didn't want to um but and then denise is killed off camera that was lame we see her body much later on in the the tunnels underneath but then may's head is in the bed instead of denise's um which I get why they did that, because if it was Denise's head, then Peter Barton's character and Marty, Linda Blair, they would never have gone back inside the mansion later on. They go back inside later because Denise is just missing. So they're like, we got to go back inside and look for her. The sequence where uh, Seth climbs the fence was pretty suspenseful. I like that scene. You're just wondering if at any point the killer's just going to pop up and like pull him down on the spikes but he gets over and then he tells Peter Barton to throw his boots over the fence even though if you look it can clearly fit underneath <laughs> so that just made me laugh it's like dude just slide them under you don't need to throw them over then this is when uh, Seth goes to the police station and of course they don't believe him and so he goes into the evidence room and steals a shotgun and some shells so easily like no one's paying attention and then he steals a car the guy's like i'm gonna call the cops he's like good call them tell them that i'm gonna be at garth manor and then we get this really cool sequence with the killer going up through the floor uh where the rug is and the rug is just raising in the background this is like happening while they're just talking facing the other direction they don't know what's happening behind them very cool sequence but then like he stabs the killer with the pitchfork and then he takes it out, and for some reason he's like, you know, take the rug off. It's like, no, just keep stabbing. I'm like, no, I need you to take the rug off of him, and then I can stab him. But he takes the pitchfork out. The rug looks like it's still over a body the whole time. And then when she pulls it off, there's no body there because he went inside the hole. It's like, dude, if 
realistically, that rug would have been shifting. It would have been moving. It would have collapsed when his body went through the hole. It wouldn't have looked like there was a body still underneath it the entire time. So then they're exploring the tunnels and this is when they find Denise's body. I don't, I don't know what exactly happened to her. Her body looks fine. I'm not sure what happened. I think there's a little bit of blood. So I don't know what he did to her, but she's dead at the table with rats and all kinds of corpses around her. Looks very like happy birthday to me. You know, this happened in a lot of movies in 1981, uh, Madhouse. And so there's all these dead bodies down there from the, you know, the other family members of the Garth family. So you're telling me they never found those bodies either? Because like I said earlier, the, the pranksters knew about the tunnels. They had explored them before. And they said something about having them wired up, like they had some pranks set up down there. So they never discovered the bodies either. So Seth comes back, he finds out that there's a hole in the gate, so he never needed to climb over. If he just walked about 15, 20 feet over there, there was a hole in the gate the entire time. So if only they knew, right? And then he gets in the fight with the killer and shoots him, and then he comes back for one last scare, like a typical horror movie, but he shoots him again, kills him, and we think it's over. And he goes inside and he's like, you know, I killed him, you should have seen it. And then all of a sudden the hand comes in from the side, revealing that there's two killers and you know which would have been a nice surprise if they didn't already kind of spoil it like I said there was like two instances before this where they kind of already revealed that there's two killers not to mention that the guy he's fighting at the fountain he doesn't look like they've already shown the face of the guy who uh, killed Peter with the scythe so we know what he looks like he doesn't look like the guy that uh, Seth killed. So that revealed it right there too. So I feel like the twist could have been handled better. So after Seth is killed, I guess he got shot. The shotgun rolls across the floor and then Linda Blair is yelling out loud what her plan is. Like, I'm gonna go get the gun. Okay, kill her. I'll be down there in 30 seconds. Be ready to grab me. And then when she gets down there, of course, there's the killer. He lunges at her as soon as she goes for the gun. Poor Jeff gets killed, thrown out a window. His kill's not that great, but I really felt sorry for the character. I liked his character, and he just gets thrown right out the window. And, you know, she is, like, climbing down the ladder, and we get this good, like, window scare. She's climbing down. There's, like, this dark window right there, and he bursts through and grabs her. She gets the keys from Peter's dead body, and runs to the car the car won't start but she said earlier that she's a mechanic so she fixes it right away and then drives off and then we get like this halloween four scare his face just pops up on the windshield breaks it and you know she may be good at fixing cars but she sure as hell ain't good at driving them as soon as he does that she does this oh just let's go of the wheel and then she, like even 10 seconds later in the scene Every time it cuts back to her, she's still not holding the wheel. She's like, ah, I'm so scared. It's like the car's swerving all over the place. Like, grab the wheel, lady. Jesus Christ. And then the gate's broken. It's like facing it the other way. And then she drives into it. The spiked fence goes through the killer. So that was a great demise of the killer. And, you know, shockingly, at the very end, you would think that he's going to, like, move one last time or jump at her or something. But she just walks by his dead body. He never moves, never says anything. And then the screen just freezes and it's over. And another thing I, I was expecting was to hear like sirens in the distance because Seth stole the car, told that guy, you know, yeah, call the police. Tell them where I'm going to be here. Send them there. They never come. So that was another thing I was expecting that never happened. So, yeah. Happy ending for Marty, and no final scare, nothing like that, nothing typical, nothing cliche like that. She just walks off into the sunset. The end. So, uh, what are your thoughts on Hell Knight? Let me know in the comments below. And as always, if you like what you've seen here, you can hit this like button and become a subscriber today just by clicking the My Cartoon Face in about five seconds. And remember, it's all an opinion. You don't need to get butthurt about it.